three, two, one, and we are back. Julia is just threatening that if I go on some long rant today, she's not going to stick it out for the whole podcast. That's right. Actually, I have something that's kind of funny that a, a coaching client sent me. But uh, I guess I would put on the list of things I hate, but we can save that up for later. It is funny, though. Well, we just, so at, we need to do our um, our uh, our warning, right? Warning, yes. Warning. This is the Sunday podcast. This is not our normal podcast. On Sunday, we will talk about whatever comes to our mind in whatever sort of random order in which it comes into our mind. There is no agenda, no checklist, no points. And there should be no no notes to take. This is just you guys having a conversation with Julie and I as we sit around on our beach close villa here in Puerto Rico. And we defrag from the prior week and we sort of put our thoughts together about what we're looking forward to the week to come. So yes. then you have, Good would morning. you like, to, yeah, that's your warning. So it's totally random. That's what we're saying. And uh, we should just call it the random show, but somebody else already has a good podcast called that, so I didn't want to steal that name. But that is what Sunday is for us, and so hopefully you guys, well, I know you do, because a lot of you um, actually are listening on Sunday about the normal peak day for us, which is actually on a Wednesday. You know, there is something actually I was thinking about talking about today. I'll just talk about it. It's not much of a rant. It won't last. I was thinking about why everyone doesn't start their own podcast, and I was thinking like, that's such a no-brainer thing to do nowadays as far as disseminating information, you know. Sure. If you think about, like, how hard it is, if you wanted to – everyone needs to produce – you have to obviously do proactively generation. Mm -hmm. You have to do things like that. And, you know, if you just do that as a real estate practitioner, frankly, if all you do is proactively generation and you never do anything else – you're going to do great. You don't yeah. have to really do anything else. But you have to keep that focus that that is your number one job and not right. get distracted by the five million things that are trying to get you off track. Right. So now, yeah. why is that related to podcasting? Well, it isn't really. The reason I'm telling you this is because I'm not going to tell you the podcasting or anything else passive is going to replace real work of real estate, which is proactive lead generation. You know, we've never, just to put a period at the end of that sentence, um, you can definitely sell a lot of houses without ever doing low, uh, uh, you know, proactive lead generation, but you're not going to, you won't make any real money. No, 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 don't get me wrong. You might have great revenue, but you're not going to make any profit. And so that's the reason ultimately after coaching yeah. agents for a couple of decades that we refuse to even come close to, you know, misleading you guys that there is a shortcut to ever, you know, lasting long-term levels of success in real estate and everything else in life. Other than just being proactive, being passive at anything in life will result in, you know, either utter or some resemblance of failure. So with that in mind, you know, just listen to last week's podcast we, and the week before that, we were really drilling down and helping you guys kind of cut through the Mickey Mouse that is so prolific in, um, in essentially real estate education nowadays about doing things passively for lead generation. So we're not going to talk about that because that would be a first class level five rant. <laughs> okay. Stay tuned for that later in the yeah. week. No, I don't want to do that. <laughs> yeah. I, I need a break from that on we Sunday. Need but we need with, a break too. But with that said, they really should, everyone listening really should start a podcast. And I'll tell you, ultimately, the reason you should start a podcast is because if nothing else, it is a really interesting way to meet and connect with um, people and, and a podcast gives you permission, if you do it right, in my opinion, um, to just do like we're doing it today, where we're just being unfettered. We're just having a conversation. And it does. And here's what's fascinating about podcasting in general. Um, you know, if you look at all the different podcast topics there are out there, and there's just billions of things that people will do shows about, mostly things that interest them. And sure enough, if there's something that interests you, chances are there's other people just as weird as you you know they might be in some corner of the world someplace that are also interested in whatever the hell it is you're interested in and the next thing you know you start forming a community and you start having these these relationships you know you could have done that with hypothetically on um you know social networking sites and whatnot you could form relationships that way but something about podcasting is so pure um and i think it's because no one's really figured out well this is the reason no one's really figured out how to monetize it yet so podcasters, it's yet. right? It's not polluted exactly. Mm -hmm. I think Joe Rogan selling to Spotify. We might see the first yeah, step of the slippery slope, but the big money hasn't entered into podcasting, and it hasn't essentially made it so that people's opinions are so um, persuaded by their advertisers. At the end of the day, or what they say is an attempt to get advertisers, and you see a lot of that on um, just you know that's just media in general. They have bills to pay, right? But on podcasting, it's still in this sort of. I don't know, this pure sense where people are just doing it for the sake of doing it. 
Yeah. You know, that's art you know, for the I sake of doing the art, opposed yes. to trying to do it for the sake of selling it. It's more pure that way, I think. And yeah. you can be much more targeted. You, you know, you probably listen to twice as many podcasts as I do, but, um, you know, I really like, there's different ways to use a podcast, right? There's like educational, there's entertainment, um, there's motivation. You can seek out and be targeted. You know, we talk a lot like in the Harris Rules book and on coaching calls about controlling what goes into your head. Well, you can really use podcasts to hone that in right? and do a, just a way better job than if you do any other type of media. Well, like, so you and I are still selling real estate. We're in Central Ohio. We're in New Albany, mm-hmm. Ohio, and we're selling this beautiful area, you know, where we used to live, New Albany Country Club area. Mm-hmm. One of the, still one of the most, I don't even yeah. know, maybe the most beautiful neighborhood in all of the Americas that we've ever been into. Yeah, it's, I think we appreciate it more now that we don't live there, but yes. Yeah, but it was it's spectacular. It's definitely spectacular. Yeah. It's more like if you guys are ever in Columbus, Ohio, drive through the New Albany Country Club area, you just, you know, you're, you're thinking I'm exaggerating, I'm not even close to exaggerating. But anyway, um, so if we are still living there, um, I would do, I would have us do a podcast, just mm-hmm. talk about living there. That's it. And yeah, I would, sure. And I would call it, you know, life in New Albany or something. Yeah. Right. And I would talk about the things that are going on. I wouldn't make it a, um, like... I wouldn't give them the sports scores, and it wouldn't be like some sort of you know homegrown AM station. I wouldn't do it that way. No, but I just it's more you of a community-based kind of. N- not fun even honestly, I wouldn't. You know, that's that, what that's, are you doing, and who are you seeing? That's the whole community-based thing is so overdone. There's so many people that disseminate information like that. You, just think, Julie, local newspaper. Well, you I have, didn't mean it like that. I meant like, um, you know, what's happening in in you know, maybe something that you went to that was fun in the community yeah, and exactly. making it more uh, familial in a way. Yes, exactly. But I would, I would yeah. even be, I would be even more selfish to be honest. Like, you Just know what? Have a discussion. I would take this podcast, this Sunday podcast that we do and look, our regular listenership, we have tens of thousands of listeners. Mm-hmm. We have, um, oh, there's two cool things I want to tell you. Don't let me, don't let me forget two cool things I want to tell you. Um, we have tens, this is the number one listen to daily podcast in at least the United States. Mm-hmm. So, in our podcast during the week, it's a lot of listens because people like the more sort of, you know, institutionalized, professional, you know, more educational top, top, right, coaching that we do. Mm-hmm. Whereas on Sunday, it's just you and I, you know, being you and I for the most part. Unplugged. Would you agree? Yes. Yeah. To the, for the most part. Yeah. We're 90% That's unplugged incredible. on this podcast. Yeah. 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 Um, but the, uh, the, the fear that people have starting podcasts is that they have to do it like we do it during the week. Mm-hmm. And and I'll be honest with you guys, you guys don't have, probably most of you will never have the opportunity, this sounds terrible, but to be as good as we are during the week, because Julie and I have presented that information for so long, have done so many uh, coaching calls, and what we're essentially doing on our weekly podcast is we're taking the coalescence of the coaching calls that we've done, and Julie and I have done at least 100,000 one-on-one coaching calls each. The calls, the books, the events, you know, everything. Yeah, so what I'm saying is to, like, if you guys, and here, here's where I can see where someone would listen to our normal podcast, and they'd say, well, crap, I can't string my thoughts together like that. I can't, um, you know, I don't want to have to take the time and figure out seven points that are this or ten, three, mm-hmm. or, you know, I get it, and, and I wouldn't either, and if I were in your position, listeners, and I had not been a done what Julie and I've, you know, done for the past forever. I, and I heard that podcast and I'd think to myself, well, I can't replicate that because I couldn't, I couldn't do it in such a way that it would be listenable. But where you can do it is you can do it like we do it on Sunday, Mm -hmm. like today where we're just talking. And I think that's ultimately what people would really like. So for example, if you did a podcast and that's the other thing is people get overwhelmed by the production quality of it. Um, yeah, a, I think people get intimidated and think that they've got to have like a sound engineer and right, they've got to have don't. an editor and all this, and you really don't. In fact, I think people really enjoy it a lot more when you are authentic and maybe like you know we're I'm sure we're going to have some green parrots fly over. Uh, yeah, exactly. But you don't have to overthink it, and I think that a lot of people just get intimidated by what they perceive what to saying. be the process. That's what I'm saying, yeah. and you don't you don't have to do anything. And there's so many. I'll I'll give you guys a list of. Uh, um, audio bursts, write that down. Audioburst.com, I believe they're out of uh, Australia, or no, they're out of Israel. And what? Uh, just you go research it yourselves. I don't, I don't need to tell you. Um, write down Podbean. Um, might be Podbeam. No, it's Podbean. So write that down. P O D B E A N dot com. Um, that's who we syndicate our podcast through. Um, and uh, I don't necessarily. I know we have an intro. I know we have an exit on our podcast. But honestly, you don't even really need one anymore. Uh, most podcasts I listen to, it's just, you know, Joe Rogan's, for example, this is the most popular in the world. And he's got, 
he sold it to Spotify for a hundred million dollars. He's got no, you know, real lead in or lead out. It's just something very to the point. Yeah. Um, you can, you don't have to push your uh, podcasts onto um, YouTube, make them into videos. But if you do, most of the major podcasters they use a company like Audio Burst, who then makes your podcast into a video, and you don't even have to do that. And that's super cheap and it's automated. So these are all the just different little widgets. As far as like. Um, let me tell you the software that we're using that we really don't even have to do anything for. I'm, I gotta, so Julie and I record our podcast every day. You guys won't believe this. We record it directly into my iPhone. And then I take my iPhone and I load the audio file right up into Podbean. That's how it works. That's how simple it works. And guys, write this down. These are the, Julie and I are actually, we have a, um, a full blown podcasting situation with microphones and a mixing board and all that. But honestly, we hardly ever use it. it. Just it's sitting there collecting dust. I'm honestly embarrassed to look at it. All the pain in the ass, the money that went into putting it together. That, we'll we'll get back to it. Will. Yeah, we'll get back right. to it. Maybe you know, it's on the list. I know. Yeah, yeah, I know. Yeah. I'm always we'll thinking there. of another. Well, it's because it's such a hassle. And truthfully, the audio quality from what we're using is so it's good. It's not radically different. Mm -mm. So, yeah. guys, here it is. The mics that Julie and I use. Write this down. They're just little lavalier, uh, you know, uh, directional mics, and that's what they are. They're lavaliers. We're holding a couple lavaliers, and that uh, it's a Rode R O D E um, S C six L, and then this thing, yep, that's what I'm using. And then we have a couple Rode lavaliers, and I know you guys are going to want to know the software we're using, and I'm going to try to find out without screwing up this recording. All right, here it is. It's Ferrite, F E R R I T E, and see here's how this works. Literally, I plug the road thing with the two lavaliers plugged into the road thing into the iPhone, and I got the Ferrite software loaded, and I hit record, and the thing records, and then after it's done recording, I then can basically tell it where to upload it to. I can upload it directly to Podbean, and then it's S, and after that, everything's done. Podbean then publishes your show. Some of the show, some of the, um, uh, like, uh, so is it Spotify and uh, Audible? You have to apply. It, it doesn't happen automatically, but virtually everybody else, when like Podbean will take your podcast and they'll push it, uh, load it up to uh, iTunes, and then it automatically will load up to about five or six different podcasting places. So, what I'm saying is, you don't have to do all the Mickey Mouse technical stuff, it's all totally automated. And then the couple, there's you can add to, like I said, Audible, and you can add uh, Spotify. And there's, and there's a few others, too, you can add to. Um, I think we're syndicating now on maybe 20, maybe 25 different platforms, which is really cool. But what I'm trying to convince you guys of is you don't need to worry about uh, overly producing it. You don't need to worry about your content being too fancy. You don't need to worry about intros and exits. You don't need to worry about anything. Matter of fact, you don't even need to worry about listeners. You don't even need to worry about how many people are paying attention. Just do it to start just for your own for fun and, and you can do it by yourself you don't have to have a partner you know you can you could do interview style interview style is probably the most popular um, you know we don't do more interviews frankly because they're a pain in the butt to organize and a lot of the people that want to be interviewed are also trying to sell you guys something and I don't want to have to you know I want to keep what we're doing pure I don't want to have competing messages or somebody's product on I mean, we, I'll give you guys an example it was four years ago we had a product called uh, well I don't even tell the name of it and the guy was saying some stuff on this interview, and this interview was set up through um, his uh, publicist, or I don't remember who. And, um, he, well, he was saying some stuff that was some straight up, straight up BS, and I knew it, and I obviously didn't let it get by me. Well, after that, I got, they were so mad, and so it's like, oh my gosh, so really, someone's going to come on here, and I'm supposed to just shut up and let them lie to my listeners? Not going to happen. <laughs> so it's very hard to find really good podcasts um, guests. The, our favorite interviews when we do them are definitely with the uh, superstar agents out there, which we're going to certainly do more of. But anyway, in conclusion, I would strongly suggest all of you guys start doing a podcast because podcasting is going to start and already has started becoming, um, I mean, it's the largest thing in terms of the uh, dissemination of information. What I, what I mean by that is there's more people uh, running to podcasts to get their information than any other source of information since the Gutenberg Press. In other words, there's not been an, a, an increase this rapid in people consuming information through a relatively new medium since the advent of the mass-produced newspaper. You guys getting what I'm saying here? So those of you who have over-invested in you know, video and all that, that um, ship has sailed. And so you need to seriously consider doing podcasting. And uh, I think you'll discover that 
after a while, those the benefits from all the audio and all the content you pushed out there will start to reinforce your normal messaging and actually might create some new opportunities and paths forward for you that you may not have ever considered. Yeah, well, what a great, uh, unique selling proposition for an agent if somebody's searching or deciding and your podcast comes up. I think most people are pretty impressed by that. I mean, it at least makes you different. Well, uh, you know, you, you were saying that. I was just thinking about a podcast I was listening to. There's this podcast I listened to. It was only like 20 minutes long. Mm-hmm. It's done by, um, you know, I'm a I'm a collector card nerd, right? Certain kinds of cars, I just they're my hobby. I'm not doing a lot of it anymore but because we live in Puerto Rico. But I still can listen and read about them, right? So there's this guy named Greg Stanley that has this podcast, like I said, 15, 20 minutes long. And he is a auction. He works for RM Sotheby's Auctions. And he is a guy whose job, in essence, is to go out and find inventory for RM to auction off. So it's sort of like a listing agent goes out and finds houses. So this guy's job is to basically go out and find listings and then he gets, I'm sure, a commission on the whatever the seller pays, you know, just like a normal, you know, think of it in terms of listing real estate. So his podcast is very, it's good because what he all he does is he takes two or three of, uh, you know, car collector type news headlines um, that, you know, maybe had some um, momentum online and he'll just talk about those things a little bit. And then he might, um, he'll do a light pitch saying, hey, listen, if you're looking to sell your collector car, let's talk. Maybe I can help you through RM Sotheby's, la da 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 And then sometimes he has guests, but really all it is is him talking about some of the experiences he had during the previous week and then pulling in some headlines that as car nerds like. I mean, I listen to it and I realize Julie suffers through it sometimes yeah, listening to it. you feel like you're up to date on what's happening in the yeah, collector definitely. car market and it's coming from a valued resource that's right. in it more than you are because it's his totally. job. So, you know, I think that has a lot of value. It does. But the, so going back to the idea, if we are still yeah. in Albany and we are selling real estate there, mm-hmm. I absolutely would do it. And I'd keep it yeah. super informal. And I wouldn't worry about it if I was being no. judged or what people thought. That's it's what makes it more. podcast. Right. But that's what makes it more authentic is when you have the little foibles and the parrots sure. in the background. That's what makes something more listenable. Okay. Mm-hmm. Now, here's the, the big announcement. Okay. Okay. First of all. On Amazon, I believe we now have over 400 five-star reviews in the book. Huh, that's awesome. Yep. And some of the late and, um, but that's the really cool news is now we are having this podcast or a normal podcast listened to in over 54 different countries. That's amazing. (laughs) I I was thinking like, I probably would, I bet you I could name maybe 25 countries and then I'd have to look at the map or the globe and that's pretty amazing. I mean, think about, about, yeah, that's incredible. So thank you, loyal listeners and And, new listeners. And like, so I think maybe two or three listeners, that that might be just some sort of, you know, an anomaly, right? That might be an issue in the code. But we've got like 30 listeners, like 30, so like 33 listeners in like... Mongolia, Or something. Yeah, exactly. Well, what's going on there? There must be one broker in Mongolia. (laughs) I don't know, but like I said before, I'd like to know who their internet provider is because you don't think of that as Larnell, right? (laughs) But yes, I mean, that's, so when I go through these lists of these countries, I mean, you know, maybe like, I don't know, 40 through 50, starting, let's say starting around 40, 40 through 54, you know, then you're looking at single digits. You're looking at eight downloads or seven streams or whatever. Still, it's interesting though. Yeah, so those might, honestly, like I said, those might be mistakes. But the rest of the, the others of them in the code, I, you know, so for those of you who are listening to us all over the world in names of countries where, frankly, we have to look on the globe to see where you are, <laughs> thank you for listening to us. We really do sincerely appreciate it. I know most of you listen to us for our real estate content, but I've also noticed a lot of you guys are small business owners. They're listening to us because we have a uh, tendency to... Uh, give you guys no BS, you know, direct tactical information. And, 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 you know, this is what you're, you know, the feedback you're giving us as to why you listen. So I really sincerely appreciate it. And yes, keep listening, keep downloading, and we're going to keep what we're doing. And we're going to, you know, obviously always try to improve the content by improving ourselves to which brings Julie to, I'm sure some inevitably bizarre series of articles that she was saving up just for Sunday's show. Uh, well, Okay, so, you know, I do the premiere calls all through the week, and I, which means that I'm hearing from our coaching members all over the country, all over the world, all of what they're going through, they're dealing with, and they're all just, I mean, completely in momentum. It's such a, a strong market right now that they're going through a lot. But uh, one of the games that we play in premiere is Top That Real Estate Story. <laughs> 
<laughs> because it keeps them coming. And sometimes, many times, it has something to do with prospecting, where they can't believe that this is the person they're working with. Oh, you mean you have the students, basically? Yes, it's them. The I story? Yeah, because oh. I have my book of stories from our career, which right. I will one day write. So what's your craziest story? Is this one okay. from Louie Ann? Yes. Oh, boy. And I researched it. Okay, so uh, one of our longtime coaching members and friends and associates, Louie Ann Eichhorn in Texas, She's, you know, she's on the calls quite often and she hears us play like top that real estate story. A lot of times it's like, have you ever heard of that happening in an inspection? And I think she wins this week's session because she sent me something. It's called uh, somebody found it, I guess, in the wood of a house and it's called bleeding tooth fungus, which (laughs) like you don't even have to see a picture of that to imagine how disgusting it was. Only in Texas. Oh, probably. Actually, this was in the uh, Northwest because it's actually a mushroom. This, oh. this was somebody that she knew from a, a um, Facebook page or something. Oh. So uh, it wasn't one of her deals. I think in Texas it would have been vaporized by the summer sun. It, it had been red wasps flying around with like right. in stealth <laughs> mode. You can't hear or see until they have attacked you. Until they're and, on you. And they breathe exactly. fire. And red wasps in Texas, guys. If you've, never seen, if you've never seen a red wasp, okay, it's not like you think it is. It's like you think it is, about 10 times as large. And it, way meaner. And just totally, completely pissed off. And it's murderous intentions, for sure. It just And I remember the first time someone, you know, when we moved to the house we had in Texas, and there we had this barn we had, which was infested with different kinds of wasps. And the guy that came by to help us basically get the house, you know, livable, he said to us, he goes, um, you know, the black wasps, when they sting you, that hurts. But he goes, the, you know, it was Greg. Is yeah. the the red the red wasps? Those things will take you out for a week. And I'm like, dude, the damn thing is red. It's three times larger than the black ones. Do you think I needed to be told to avoid it? <laughs> and they're faster. How oh, dumb do I also, look? <laughs> they're also attracted to movement. So when you discover and noise, when you start flailing, then it's extra exciting. And noise. And noise. And yeah. I think more annoying than that, I think, was the red ants because you could be standing right in them and didn't know that until they were on you. Yep. Also, really horrible. So back to bleeding sex. tooth fungus. Yeah. So I'm like, okay. I see a lot of this kind of thing come and go from my email and the calls, so I kind of set it for later. I'm going to research this. Well, first of all, it is just as disgusting as you imagine it. Imagine kind of a a misshapen mushroom that's kind of grayish white with actual red dots oozing like a bloody tooth. I mean, really gross. So I guess this thing is somehow symbiotic with uh, different plants and uh, uses the plant's carbon monoxide or something and then somehow benefits the plant. It's a symbiotic thing. So then it goes on to talk about how you probably don't want to eat it. Like, really? You have this to be, is, this, this is, is the like red, the wasps. The like, you have to be story. told that. Yeah, exactly. Uh, but anyway, my my uh, real estate brain went directly to, well, that's one more thing in a home inspection we're going to all have to deal with, just when we thought it couldn't get crazier. So that Luann story wins. That's so do you remember the first time you and I were, um, we went to a restaurant and we had crabs and the mm-hmm. waiter thought mm-hmm. he had to tell us not to eat the green stuff? Oh, I know. It's so gross. It's like <laughs> Somebody's crab shack. I remember but, that. You know, yeah. it, is, it is pretty funny. There has to be when you're, you know, like uh, just the things that people say. Like I, I was going to go right to the green stuff. Like, no, had no, he not said that. Exactly. And then I was going to go out basically and try to find a red wasp to ride around on like a dragon. Seriously. <laughs> I know. I don't actually have any wacky news this week. I was too busy. Yeah. Well, um, the potential of finding life on Venus was kind of a that story was that cool. was missed by everybody. Talk about it. Um, I, I think it was even... Venus. I'm pretty sure it was, it was Venus. Venus. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah, they found basically some kind of uh, element or molecule. It's oh, been no, about a week remembering. that could only be uh, the result of an organic uh, byproduct. Or okay, but she's forgetting the funny part. So this didn't one of the scientist scientific things you and I sent back and forth. So the only type of essentially oh. bu- butane or gas it, that's type that exact it's, yeah from penguin guano from penguin poop, right? How, first of all, how do people know that? Exact. Well, no Who studies no. The, that to break down all the things that just went into <laughs> what I just said from that article. Mm-hmm. So here we are sitting on planet Earth, and there's some yeah. scientist that discovers on Venus some sort of you know. You know, gas or something, and then he has a piece, of, uh, an instrument, then then can break down the molecular structure of the gas. Okay, I'm not done. Yeah. So that's a hell of a, a that's, thing, that's right? A thing, yeah. Yeah, I don't, you know, that's a really interesting telescope filter. Is all I'm saying, Absolutely. right? Mm-hmm. Okay. Then from the the exact formula, he had some sort of software program that compared it to all the other, you know, flatulent byproducts. <laughs> okay. 
<laughs> that might that it might Gases, be a, I emitting guess, in from. A broad sense, but and it could be, okay, I'm not yeah. done. I'm not I, done. Yeah. And at some point, somebody had got some poor pelican who was trying to have a moment. Penguin. Penguin. Who, They're right, slower. Yeah, penguin <laughs> who was trying to have a little, you know, private time. Yeah. And uh, you know, kept some of his stuff for scientific study. I don't know how else to say it. Yeah. But just think of all the people that had to have been involved in the ability Tangled for web. some scientists to be able to determine that the gas was similar, if not the same, that comes from a butt of a penguin. I know. What a story, <laughs> right? But scientifically, and I'm, you know, very much armchairing scientific here. Um, That's a lot of free time to research that. Indeed. But they said that it uh, could only be produced by something organic and it uh, even if it kind of decays over time it regenerates itself so something is continuously producing this it's life it's life okay form. and so I, my other thought was only in 2020 can that story not get any not really feel any love it just slid right past underneath all the other 2020 nonsense well it just is lu- the lunacy too if you think you remember julian assange back from 2006 yeah. or 2016 right yes you know the whole thing well you know he's been arrested and he's in england he's on trial did no, you even I know, didn't that? know that yeah no exactly story. so julian julian assange you guys should research him yourself the whole wikileaks guy here we are essentially you know was one of the biggest hypothetical, regardless of what side of that conversation you're on, but should have been one of the biggest news stories ever. I mean, here's this yeah. guy that essentially was able to, through his WikiLeaks online newspaper, you know, have all these people leak to him this information that sort of showed the government's overreach in so many different ways globally and just all this other crazy stuff. Things that were maybe, I guess this trial ferreted it out maybe, whether these things were legal, whether so, just look, guys. This is the ultimate uh, Tom Clancy novel. Is what yeah. I'm saying, right? I mean, this is Tom Clancy meets Jason Bourne, and you know, James Bond just didn't even qualify to show up to this one. Yeah, okay, that's it's what I'm very saying. Intriguing and, and, and yet, nobody's talking about it. Nope, not even a word of it. So yeah, and we're not talking about you know potential life on planet Venus. It's just baffling. Yeah, I don't know. Very 2020. Yeah, politicized. Everything's politicized. That's the reason. Yeah. Everybody's, because look, if I'm telling you about the uh, potential life on Venus, where there's no angle for me other than just disseminating information, yeah. I, I can't get you to think my way. Uh, you know, so there's no there's no political th- angle to it. There's no it's potential poli- exactly. Yeah, so it's Facts not news. Don't get much press, right? So it's not news. So it's, unless yeah. you can spin it to to side with your you know your perspective or your newspaper that you're publicizing for then it ain't going to get said no that's what's amazing. happened yeah. yeah so everything basically has a political political bent to it i know whether it's you know the wildfires and hurricanes and you know whatever else is going on somebody's got an angle on it well i actually on both sides i but, actually read you know. an article about i mean these fires that are happening out west they've been happening out west for a long time but the question then becomes um why is it that these fires have gotten so intense and so uh, common Mm -hmm. and they say global warming or they say just all these different things and wasn't there some sort of gender uh, (laughs) what the hell was that oh it was was caused by a gender reveal party yeah fireworks that they showed fireworks well no that's what they're saying that's what they're saying i Uh, have not fact checked so so i read something that was very interesting and the article in essence was saying that the fires are almost always starting um because of the actual grid itself being most of it in California from the 1920s. So the grid itself was uh, built as part of one of the big work projects to pull the country out of a, um, you know, the depression. And so out in California, I'm sure this is true with most of the country, you have these power poles and they, I don't know anything about any of this, but in those big, you know, barrel things that are at the top and all the uh, electrical componentry that, you know, connects one pole to the next. Well, evidently a vast majority of those have never been updated since the twenties. And those things are literally igniting and the power stations are not uh, the, the companies the trees have grown up around them and then you have you know obviously kindling to the left kindling to the right and then these uh old antiquated you know way outdated things that are never even designed to last that long of you know of course they're way past their prime and they're causing a lot of these fires well so but that's the interesting thing Mm -hmm. so then this article then is talking about well why is that true why isn't in california in particular the grid been updated and the reason was and this guy obviously had an angle based on what i'm about to tell you but still interesting nonetheless is a lot of the power country or power companies were essentially um, politically coerced to stop investing in the 
you know, the grid, infrastructure. the infrastructure, and start putting it all towards um, green energy, solar, wind. Mm -hmm. And so the the point of the article was that these companies essentially, which are in some cases publicly traded, but in no way not socialized, they're essentially run by the local governments and the mm -hmm. state government. And then a lot of these companies, if had up to their, you know, they would choose to spend their money on things that would keep their existing infrastructure sound. But politically, they're essentially having to follow the strongest winds that are telling them to build solar and build wind. Now, I'll tell you where mm -hmm. I'll, I, so I, was, I kept on reading about this. Mm -hmm. and I'll tell you, listeners, why I was reading about this because I was looking actually into Julie and I were thinking about investing into a company, and so that's what got me going on this path. But then I thought started thinking. Uh, so assuming. Because I was thinking, okay, that's kind of an interesting angle. Mm -hmm. Then I got to then I got to think, so what's the probability of people being off the grid? Like, it's really freaking expensive. It is. You know, and there's some hassle involved. Yeah, and it's not like I mean, you guys want to hear how dumb we are? So <laughs> here's how dumb say. we are. I'm looking at it right now. So uh, you know, we replaced our hot water tank in our villa in Puerto Rico. It was you know, like you'd think, picture a hot water tank in a closet, right? And we replaced it with, oh, this is a great idea, a 600-gallon, which is massive, solar hot water tank. Oh, that sounds wonderful. You don't have to heat it. No you know, gas needs to heat it. No electric needs to heat it. Our energy bill will go down. Well, here's the downside. If it's cloudy out for a day, you don't have hot water. <laughs> no hot water, they, which affects not only your shower, but the whole family shower and no. the dishwasher and your washing machine. Dishwashers don't work if the shower, if the water's not No hot water for you. No, it's basically, yeah. you know, almost like not having water. It's just you have all cold. But anyway, so I was thinking about the whole grid thing. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking, well, where would, let, let's set aside costs for a second. Okay. Where would it make sense not to basically be off the grid? Where would it not, where would there be a, so like everyone should have their own backup generator. Everyone should have their backup own s backup cistern. And yeah. there's, you know, there's shortcomings with all of it, but everyone should have their own backup, um, every source of energy. And if you're in a place where you can use solar or wind um, and you, and maybe you do back it up with like a diesel generator, why the hell wouldn't you? I don't know. Honestly. Other than the cost, I don't, you know. Yeah. And internet, for example, internet, which is a, not really a utility, but, you know, effectively it is, sure. your internet provider. But there, that's that whole industry is going to be completely rocked when 5G goes online. But not only mm -hmm. that, the, you know, the many satellites that um, Elon Musk has secretly been shepherding up into yeah. low atmosphere that's going to net the whole world to make it so that internet is free and we bounce off satellites, which is a lot faster than virtually everything else. Well, if you're going to have essentially, uh, it gets to the point where uh, you can have a home that's completely offline because you don't need a cable company. Makes sense. You wouldn't need a mm -hmm. cable company. No. Nope. You wouldn't need, um, you know, the gas company. You wouldn't need the water company. Mm -hmm. Well, so then where does that leave opportunities going forward? Um, and, and I think the answer is it's st stuff's too expensive. Mm -hmm. I mean, just the stupid Well, I remember what a flat screen TV used to cost. Yeah. Well, but it's and a long it's ways not. off. Yeah. We we'll need some engineering. So. Yeah. So when these people are talking about having things go green and all that and green energy, you know what they're talking about from a state perspective makes sense because they want to try to maybe like, well, in Texas, for example, where mm -hmm. we used to live right outside of Georgetown, it was the largest um, uh, solar panel array yeah. anywhere, I think, in the United States. Mm -hmm. And if I remember correctly, Georgetown had actually gotten itself completely off. Yes, it was um, one of the leading towns of that. Right, to provide mm -hmm. electric just from, so th that's yeah. the way it would have to be institutionalized. Yeah. But ultimately, don't you think it would cost cities less? Because they wouldn't be repairing all this old crap all the time? I well, wonder. Probably. Uh, Long term. Well, not to mention the fact that essentially pulling the dinosaur juices and whatnot out of the earth is getting more and more uh, expensive. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if yeah, if you can ultimately, if you can replace all that stuff with alternative energy, but the intervening, like how do you go from there here to it's there? The transition. It's like a transitioning it's too, market. It's, it's, it's too the expensive, part. right? Yeah. But so like our stupid generator was what twenty grand. Mm -hmm. I mean that was ridiculous. Mm -hmm. And then you go through all the other and lists. Then you have to keep the maintenance of it, of course. Right, and you go through all the lists of the yeah. things that you would take to take your house offline. You would have to be at this point in order to do it. We had to do it just because we we're living in a place with a very, you know, the grid here. Electric goes off here in a perfect day, just for no particular reason, for like twenty minutes, just because. Not even windy. <laughs> Not even windy. It'll just. Oh, I'm gonna take a siesta. Yeah, it's just fragile, you know. <laughs> yeah, and so that's you know, so we have to basically have backups to everything here. So we're kind of getting used to it. But yeah, I don't think these arguments, these yeah, big no. politicized arguments about putting, making everything green, there's too many people that wouldn't be able to afford the expense of doing all of that stuff. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, but it is fascinating though, I think, honestly. Mm -hmm. you know, I, Something in my mind went, I wonder whether 
the uh, home warranty companies are covering solar and things like that now. They're not. They exclude it. So. And matter of fact, matter because it's too expensive. Mm-hmm. Probably. And most of your home um, home insurance too. If you have uh, solar panels or any of this other stuff, you have to. They sometimes won't cover. You have to uh, spend a lot of extra money for a rider. Mm-hmm. So. Anyway, interesting th- stuff. Yeah, not that interesting, but interesting. Well, you know, yeah. that's good. I mean, it's kind of nice to have a non-radical week this year. You know, interesting stuff. But oh, you I mean our know. defragging? I, I, our, our defragging yeah, isn't violent there's, this there's, week. Exactly. You know. <laughs> well, what are yeah. you looking? What are you looking forward to for next week? Uh, let's see. Well, I have to remind ourselves that you know, considering it's ninety degrees and tropical here, that we're about to get into fourth quarter. And that everyone is <laughs> has so much momentum, and it's an interesting combination because normally this time of year, seeing fourth quarter come and holiday stuff, you know, people kind of tr- naturally wind down. The market usually winds down a little bit and then ramps back up for the spring. I don't see that this year. I see people doing all of their normal fourth quarter stuff and keeping serious momentum. Uh, I read a uh, Housing Wire article that was talking about in the beginning of the pandemic there were no new licensed agents. And now it's like fast and furious because of the effect of furloughs and, you know, unemployment and all that. We're just seeing what we're seeing are the ramifications of essentially not making it so that effectively uh, it's like when a car manufacturer will start doing zero finance. And what they're doing is they're selling more cars, but they know that they're selling cars they would have sold 90 to 120 yeah. dollars in the future, yeah. right? It's like that kind of market. Right. So all you're doing is you're taking, and normally when you put something on sale, you're just taking future sales and you're putting it today, which means that you're going to be hurting in the future when you wish you would have that sale. Mm-hmm. So the exact opposite's happening in real estate. You have the sales that would have happened. Um, actually, there's it's not even there's no one answer to it, but it effectively, it's all this uh, all these people that would have chosen to purchase mm-hmm. that are now wanting to purchase. But here's here's the things that the reason that that example doesn't really match up is because you still have a very in many markets you still have a constrained inventory. Very constrained, and yeah. and you have getting a lot worse for some of them. Yeah, and then you have all these things. So you have all these amazing um, competing things happening simultaneously that. You have these ridiculously low interest rates. I mean that in the best of ways. You have constrained inventory because there's not enough, mostly there's not enough move up mm-hmm. for the people to move up to. Yeah. Right? So they're not putting their houses for sale. You have the biggest sort of demographic uh, shifts happening in the history of the United States at the mm-hmm. very least. Uh, you're going to, ha- you're, you're probably, we're experiencing another baby boom, which no one's talking about, but it's going to pick up with intensity. Yeah. I'm, yeah. So you're going to have a lot more, you know, all the things are going to. Demand is going to continue. Right. Demand is going to continue. You're going to see probably um, U.S. population start to dramatically increase just because of the generational shifts and all these things are happening. So if you look at the United States as a whole, as sort of like a, if you're looking at it as a business, there's absolutely no reason to bet against the United States going forward, especially as it pertains to housing. Every single possible um, wind is at your back right now for next year to be a fantastic year. Um, but that's not universally true, of course. Yeah. I mean, there'll be a lot of agents and there'll be a lot of markets uh, where they're not experiencing that. I'm thinking about our clients in Manhattan. Where there's, Definitely. You know, yeah. there's, thir- what, there's supposed to be at least 13,000 or 15,000 vacant apartments in Manhattan. Which and, is a record, yeah. An apartment, guys, just remember, just to remind you guys, apartment isn't just what, how you think of it. Apartment's also a condo or a co-op. You can, in, in Manhattan, they call it an apartment, but it's still ownership. Yeah. It's not renting. Right. So when we say there's it. that many vacant units, a large men- number of those are unsold, you know, homes, not apartments. Not that an apartment isn't a home, but you get the idea. Um, and then you have all the new inventory that's coming for sale. So if you're selling in that market, mm-hmm. you you know obviously you've been in that market now for what three years. You're going to experience probably a lot more downside before you see any upside. Yeah, for sure. What what that market that market's in the the cycle of not wanting to catch a falling knife. That's true, but you know to our Manhattan listeners, and we really feel for you and understand what you're going through. Things do still still sell in any market. You know, we had to remind our uh, yep. members during the recession where there was a lot of the housing recession, where there was a ton of inventory. You remember when people used to do foreclosure tour buses just to see because <laughs> it, it took all day that. to see the inventory? Yep. You know, but still, and we would remind you guys then, look at the solds. Stuff's still happening, right? It might well, be to a different crowd. You're saying that you're saying it right. So she said two really important things. You guys listen. So like if you're selling in Miami, where that's another huge buyer's market in the, in the condo, you know, apartment space, um, and you're looking at a particular building and you're seeing that the inventory is measured in years, not even months, and you're yeah. seeing multiple listings, and you're seeing, but you're seeing essentially prices stall out. 
what's going to happen next in that marketplace is you're going to see one person then 10 people just drop their price and then you're going to see that building completely reset in price but then what's going to happen is that building will start looking like a value compared to its competition and then those units will start selling until the out you know that's how the market actually has to resettle but in a market like this where people don't have for foreclosures and they don't have to worry about you know and frankly in a lot of cases the payments are so low Maybe they could VRBO them. Who knows? There's lots of extends and pretend ways to keep a house that you can't afford, um, you know, that have become institutionalized. So is there going to be a precipitous drop in pricing, even in markets that are oversaturated with inventory, like Miami, like New York City? Um, maybe, maybe not. It's hard to know. There's never been, there's been lots of examples where there's been um, essentially a strong buyer's market and it's the, the market... Um, you know, the way it reacts is predictable. It's what I just, uh, you know, laid out for you guys. But in this market where you've got all these things that could, you know, sort of cloudy out the normal, be cloud out the normal behavior, who knows what the hell is going to happen next year as far as inventory. But what is going to happen is you're just going to have to, as Julie said, get into the MLS, go to the MLS, look to see what's actually sold. So before you start convincing yourself that nothing's selling, Here's the thing you got to realize. Nothing might be selling that you're used to selling or nothing might not be selling in the neighborhood in which you live or virtually not selling or in the community in which you're familiar with. We experienced that when we were selling real estate. Markets change all the time, guys. Well, so I want to stop you there for a second because for our real estate listeners, you know, uh, in coaching, we call that what's hot and what's not when you feel like <laughs> nothing's selling for you or maybe it's your inventory, maybe it's your zip code. Remember when you do your hot sheets, don't just look in what you're familiar with, what you think, you know, what you grew up on. Things change. There's shifts. You've got to know what's hot and what's, what's not. And sometimes there's just a trend that's for a little while. Maybe there's a hot new subdivision, you know, new construction. And when it sells out, maybe nothing replaces it immediately. Maybe people go across town. You know, what's going on with that? Especially now that people are less uh, inclined to be really school district um, dependent. If they're using virtual homeschool. There's a lot of changes. So you should be doing what's hot and what's not at least weekly, but do it for your overall market. And, you, and, you know, and also, your metropolitan area, not just where you like. And guys understand too, some of the trends that are taking place in real estate, they're not short term. These are gonna last decades. Some of the things that you're seeing about migration um, into you know, people moving out of the cities and people sort of having the end of it with, you know, I like I, we have coaching clients in, uh, in uh, Oregon and the areas that have been seeing the really bad, you know, political unrest. And these people are were born there, raised there, just love it, and they're leaving. And so that's not gonna be, once a lot of people hate moving in the first place, they're not freaks like Julie and I. Mm -hmm. And so when they move, they ain't, they're they not moving back. And that's what you're, you're gonna, so you're seeing some of these big macro trends happening because of a lot of the social things. But I think the biggest macro trend thing that you're seeing are people moving out of the cities. Again, not primarily for political reasons, but just because lifestyle, they just don't want to live in that lifestyle anymore. It's not worth it. The cost of the overall combined cost of living in some of these um, mega cities is not worth it in terms of the life energy you have to put into living there. And those are decisions that people are making. And that's the kind of, I don't know, the bizarre blessing that I think, um, you know, Corona 19, whatever the hell it's called. Yeah. You know what? You know, that's the bizarre blessing it gave to so many people because it caused people to it forced people really mm -hmm. to sort of take a step back, unplug from sort of their, you know, ritualized, repetitive lifestyles that maybe they've been leading for generations. Right. They're just doing with their parents to their parents. And now they're forced to have three or four months off where they're forced to reset. And then they're saying, hold oh, about How about that? Life still went on. How about that? My kid can do this or I can, you know, work virtually. And, you know, then the, the onion starts coming unraveled and they start realizing, you know, I don't have to have two cars. Maybe we don't need to have two people working. Maybe we can. And then they hit up the realtor.com or the Zillow mm -hmm. and they start That's searching right. and they think to themselves, well, let's see if I were to tell my boss that I'm not coming back to work unless I can be remote, which I've proven to him because of Corona 19 that I can work remotely and, and just it's fine. It's hard for a boss to say no to that. Exactly. Especially the rules. And, and then the boss gets enough people saying the same thing. And the boss says, huh you mean I can get rid of this lease mm -hmm. you know, I can get rid of this fixed cost and then you have these massive companies that are starting to say you know what was it there's a, oh, damn I forget the largest Goldman Sachs mm. you know mm -hmm. who based it's like I don't know probably the biggest investment house of them all yeah. they're saying like you know this remote work thing this works for us we might actually We're think okay about not having so many people come back to work anyway you guys get the point and the next thing you know sort of the rural and semi-rural you know 
areas that people have just strictly seen as um, vacation properties now all of a sudden start being yeah. where people want to live. People don't want to wait. I've heard, read, seen people say, you know what, I was going to, you know, I was, however old I was, 45, and I always told myself I was going to retire to a lake by some, you know, whatever, pine forest when I was 65. And then this thing's caused me to realize that maybe I can do it now. And I figured out how to do it and make money and the whole thing. Yeah. I mean, you have the convergence of that plus the enticement of super outrageously low interest rates. And it makes it a lot easier for people to make decisions. And if you're sitting back in Miami and you're where all the condos are and you're surrounded by all those vacancies or in Manhattan or some of these other markets that are essentially going to suffer long term trends of not of being buyers markets and you're just telling yourself the market's going to come back if you just hold out, you know, you better check yourself on that because that might not be true. And I know that's kind of harsh what I just said, but. You know, using staying with my example of Miami, who's to say you couldn't just go a little bit north or a little bit to the yeah, That's why you play what's or, hot and what's not, right? so you'll know. Expand outside of your little backyard and just and you'll discover that, you know what, there are still pe the people that are selling, for example, in those downtown um, high-rise condos in Miami, you know what they're doing? They're buying these little houses that were built in the 20s, 30s, and 40s with private yards. <laughs> it's like the reverse condo thing, Exactly. Right? Yeah. You know, so these are the Crazy. things you got to pay attention to. So if you're not experiencing a fantastic market, uh, chances are there's a fantastic market happening near you, and you just need to you learn to be it. a little bit more uh, versatile and then remember, go into that market with your mindset being a listing agent, and uh, you're not going to have really any... You won't have any too many problems making migrations and, and business moves like that. The time to do it is definitely now um, because just, again, when it comes to housing trends, housing trends aren't like, you know, I mean, you could see all kinds of trends in everything in life. I don't even have to give you guys examples. But housing trends, they last generations. A housing trend can last like 100 years. So when you see these housing trends, they start to see like they're going to not shift back then you better take it seriously or you're going to have to, you know, you're going to be suffering needlessly as you're trying to wait around for your ship to come back in. So hopefully that makes sense to all of you. Yeah. Anything else you'd like to That's say? That's all says? I got. That's all you got? We're failing at resort right now. We need to. <laughs> That's what Julie says when we work too much. She said we're failing at resort. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> we are. Right, I'm just set an example for yeah, other Yeah, people. we are. We are failing yeah. at resort. Well, I mean, there it is. So guys, listen, have a fantastic day. Um, if you're not yet in the free coaching program, if you're listening to us for uh, the first time, um, you know, a couple ways you can connect with us. Obviously, listen to the podcast every day, subscribe, buy our book. It's for sale everywhere. It's called Harris Rules. Uh, do seriously consider joining the free coaching program. And to join the free coaching program, just text the word survival to 31996. Text the word survival to 31996. And uh, yeah, I mean, most of you guys who have been with us for a long time, you are having your best years ever. And uh, those of you who are just discovering us for the first time, you're trying to, most of you waste too much time trying to decide what direction you want to go. The simplest answer is the one that your intuition tells you is the truth. And I'll, you know, I'll give you a way to decipher that. The simplest answer is almost always the correct answer. So if the simplest answer is to learn skills and to basically be of service to other people so that you can earn the right to do business with them, don't fight with that. <laughs> don't overly complicate it and think you have to start making TikTok videos. That's not how life really works. That's not how you make decisions and not how anybody makes decisions. And it's clear that people are not going to start, you know, hey, Julie, we need to hire a realtor. Let's go on TikTok and see who does the best dance moves. Yeah, that'll think? be the day. No, well, no. Okay, we have yeah. to hire a dog groomer. Maybe we can check them out on TikTok. No, 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 no. <laughs> and yet, and yet, there was an oh, article yeah. on, um, hell, I'll even say it, on Inman. I didn't tell you about this. No. And it was, uh, so TikTok got, is basically got, yeah. you know, killed this weekend. Yep. So you, and there can't be any new subscribers to TikTok, which will mm -hmm. be the end of TikTok. Yeah. Because it turns out the Chinese basically were, you know, in control of all the videos that all these people were uploading with TikTok and God knows what they were doing with all that data, but there you go. So, um, TikTok got, you know, clocked. Next. Yeah. Okay. And, um, they're in and put this article up like 10 best TikTok videos, realtor TikTok videos or something oh, no. like some sort of like, you know, eulogy for TikTok. That's no, and so, point, and no. no, no, I did. So I, I watched, yeah. they're not long. So I watched like the, I watched like three of them Yeah. and I did. I had no idea what the hell I was watching, honestly. <laughs> I mean, there was this, the first two, or maybe it was, I don't remember, there was, I remember the, uh, an attractive millennial doing a dance, and she said her name was Sally Sue Realtor or something. Okay, I get guess that's a real estate video. The next one was, I don't even remember, my brain has thankfully blocked it out. And the next one was a guy standing in front of um, 
Kevin, uh, who's the guy from Flashdance? Oh, um, you asked me too quick. Yeah. Everybody knows. Yeah. Well, you can sing the song for us so they can remember. No. <laughs> well, that guy, right? Kevin Bacon. Kevin Bacon, yeah. So the guy's standing in, on a street corner with his probably iPhone pointing at Kevin Bacon's building in Manhattan, and that constitutes a real estate TikTok video. Ugh. I'm not criticizing any of them. All I'm criticizing is the people that told you that that's right. actually it, doing work. It's not work. their fault because why would they believe that that wasn't true? The basis of comparison. Yeah, because most of them got into know. real estate. They didn't know what the hell they were and doing. And they know they're supposed to use technology and maybe right. this will be the thing. And they stumbled across somebody that told them a bunch of hooey yeah. about basically how to generate business. Which looks and be, like a lot more fun. And then certainly what we tell them to do. <laughs> and, yeah. and, and, then, and then they just didn't have the business sense to filter whether they were getting sold a you know, as your dad would say, a sack of hooey. Yep. And uh, then the next thing you know, they're making TikTok videos. I, I don't know. It's twisted, isn't it? It's a <laughs> twisted path. But, you know, the thing that makes me mad about that, uh, not just TikTok, but a lot of the other things that, you know, if, if you do this, the world will rain leads on you. Because it's, it's a lie. Impressions or whatever. Is that when the agents call to complain that, you know, I've had this thing for six months and I spent this much money and this much effort. You know, I, I just, I'm not seeing the leads. And what are they always told? Well, you haven't done it long enough. Okay. Since and you you've had 5,000 impressions, which are supposed to be worth something. Since you brought that up, I'm going to tell a story, but I'm not going to use any names. So I'm going to describe okay. the product, okay? Yep. So this was about four or five years ago. The big trend was predictive mailing. Oh, yes. Okay. Exactly you know what I'm talking, what talking about, about, right? I do. And so those of you guys who are not, a thing. you guys have not been in business for a while. Here's what it was. <laughs> and this is exactly, and I'm not making this up. Okay, so there was all these, it was a headline story of Inman, everyone was talking about it, venture funds were getting into the business and they're saying, and you know, throwing, I think even NARS, National Association of Realtors has a hedge fund and they even threw money after one of these. Mm -hmm. And it was a big deal. And Julie and I were working a lot with NARS Venture Fund and we would feature some of their um, products or their investments on the podcast, the ones that were interesting to me, frankly, and I would, uh, you know, especially if there's something new or something in alignment with our our global, you know, our worldview on real estate. And one of them came on, and here's what was the gist of it. And again, I'm not going to say the name, but the gist of it was is they're going, you're going to subscribe to a specific geographic area. They're then going to use their fancy algorithms, and they're then going to tell you which people in that particular geographic area are most likely to move. And then they're going to make you postcards and they're going to mail them out in the anticipation that this person's going to be calling you because somehow you uh, had a crystal ball and knew they were thinking about moving based on some sort of fancy algorithm. Okay. Right? You guys listening to me well, on all this? Just to clarify, and the algorithm was probably, it was a combination of things like how long they had owned their house. Right. Mortgage if they balance. they had refinanced it. Their age, how old they are. Right. You know, if their kids are out of the house or not. So, you know, sounds nice and analytical. Yeah. You could throw sure. a whole bunch of data points in there and sounds come up with a predictive, you know, and artificial intelligence, you know, mm -hmm. whatever, whatever, whatever. I mean, that was the big story, right? So everyone was talking about, holy crap, I need to get my geographic area locked in so I can be picking the apples off the fruit tree even before they know they're apples. That was the whole sales pitch. And it was not inexpensive. It was pretty damn expensive. And so I remember listening to this and I thought two things and I read about it. And then there was other companies that came up doing the same thing. I thought to myself, if you're inclined to do mailing in the first place, if that's your thing, why wouldn't you just opposed to paying these guys for their fancy algorithm and their overpriced mailing? Why wouldn't you just if this was your inclination, why wouldn't you just geographic farm that same exact area and not only catch the people that were most inclined to want to move, but also catch the people that just discovered today that they need to move, that their algorithm didn't actually catch. And that's if you actually were inclined to waste money doing direct yes. mail, which we do not suggest that you do at all, there, ever. There is no crystal ball saying, okay, I'm going to hover it over this neighborhood. I've got my map out. And that house, that house right there, they're going to sell next. Well, but if you guys want to... wanted to believe that. Right. And so if and, and so here's the another, the, my secondary thought on that. So if you're, let's say you choose an, an area of a thousand homes, let's say. And again, we're not suggesting you do a geographic farm. But if you want to know the people, okay, hold on. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you guys an unbelievably complicated formula to know exactly what sellers in your area are, are ready to, are looking to sell immediately. I'm going to tell you exactly how to have, how to find them. You guys paying attention? You are you now seriously, can I give this formula away? I don't know. This is the this secret is sauce. This is the KFC <laughs> secret formula. Make meets, uh, you know, real Coke. Ooh, that's good. I like that. Okay. Let's yeah. hear it. It's lunchtime. Yeah, you're hungry. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, call the expireds, call it for sale by owners. Call the notice defaults. 
Called Liz Penz. Call the... Um, Actually, I, call your lead follow-up when they left you a message. Call, call the... Uh, what's the... Probate. Yeah. Okay. For rent by owners. Call for rent by owners. Call the, the property. Yes, exactly all that. If you're in a vacation resort area, call the VRBOs. Holy crap. What? Yes. What I'm telling you is all the best sorts of sell- sources of seller leads uh, are out there with their hands up right now, with their hands up in the air, saying, I want to sell now. <laughs> so... The fallacy of the whole business idea of this predictive mailer thing could have only been created by somebody with no real estate background, check, could have only been sold to uh, salespeople with no real way of filtering good ideas from bad, uh, check. Yeah. And that's what happened. And this company, and there's others just like it, raised a bunch of money, and of course they all went out of business. Because what eventually happens is that agents stop paying the bill because they realize they're not getting any business from it. So that that little flash in the pan idea lasted, I think, three to five years. And guys, that's the thing. If you don't have enough time in business... Perspective. Perspective, thank you. You're not going to realize how many of these things that you guys think because somebody, you know, a series of people or a mob of people convinced you as to what you're supposed to be doing... You guys won't have the business sense, frankly, or the perspective to put it n- nicer, to know that you're, you know, you're being lied to. You're being fooled into buying something that's silly. You know, I'm sure there are agents out there listening right now that have invested a ungodly amount of time learning to dance uh, for the sake of building a big TikTok following, right? Absolutely. And they were probably listening to, um, you know, somebody tell them a fairy tale about how you have to basically big this, build this big mountain of media and somehow magically that's going to, you know, persuade people to want to do business with you. I'm sure that there are people who are on the other end of that rainbow and they're realizing now that frankly TikTok is no longer going to be around as an example that they were probably lied to. Yeah. But I wonder how many of them are actually going to have the guts to admit it and then they actually have the guts to make course direction and do something different. I wonder Well, how many. it takes a lot to admit it and you know when you want to believe that something's going to work so badly because your logical brain says, you know, okay, maybe that's cool or even if you're not thinking logically, but it's, you're doing it because your friend's doing it because you know you're supposed to do some kind of media and you don't know what else to do. Well, that's just lack of business maturity and perspective. That's not your fault. You'll get that over time. But don't torture yourself by signing up for the next six months of something that you spent too much money on that doesn't work. And the world's full of that stuff, guys, and it always will be. Um, the because, people that sell it are pretty convincing too. Some of them. Well, they're not. Even, most times, they're just basically marketers, and what they're trying to do is yeah. create some sort of whiz bang product on the back of agents because they know agents, for the most part, are not that discerning. Right. And will buy anything. And they that, want to believe. And they want to believe, and they're opportunity seekers, and so and they don't want to actually have to be put in a position where they're going to have to do what they don't want to do when they don't want to do at the highest level. So you have sort of a perfect storm for being able to sell gimmicky marketing ideas, true or mm-hmm. false. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, and what a lot of these guys do is they want to start, they want to seed the company idea and sort of make the, you know, test it inside real estate. Again, because you guys will buy just about anything um, that, you know, facilitates being, in essence, being professionally lazy and not having a skills-based business. Okay, and doing things that are proactive versus passive. Sorry if I'm offending you, just keep your mind open, Okay. The moral of the story is, is that's the reason so many of these companies are in this industry because they you, they know you guys will buy pretty much anything. Then they sort of perfect it and then they start selling it to dentists or, or uh, just any kind of other industry. They'll start selling it to people with car washes. They'll So if they come up with a specific algorithm or some specific marketing widget, um, then they then take that mid- widget after they sort of honed it in real estate and then they, they go to a different uh, industry. And that's what you see constantly. And a lot of these guru types, they do the same thing. So a lot of the people that are in the real estate industry that's, that are pretending to be gurus or experts, um, they actually came from other industries and they came to real estate because it uh, you know, was it an, an extension of what they were already doing. And that's what a lot of these social media guys are doing. They didn't, they started in like, I mean, you know, I'll use Gary Vanderchuk, for example, again, not criticizing, just giving you a true story. He started out basically by uh, essentially selling wine online. His parents' business extended it and he obviously did a great job of it. They, you know, then Gary extended, he, you know, he created, um, uh, you know, media company that is a very successful media company that focuses on helping other businesses then basically start doing social media and with the idea that, you know, obviously that's something that businesses should be focusing on. And really most businesses, guys, they don't really have a choice. They have to be focused in social because a lot of businesses, that is where the noise is. It's on social. It used to be on the three big, you know, TV stations and other sources like that. But now if you're a business, a normal business, and I do say normal, that real estate is not normal and I explain 
explain why in a second. If you want customers, you have to be hyper aware of what's going on. Here's the reason it's not true for real estate. It's not true for real estate because we can go directly after our business. We can be proactive. We can go proactively after the exact people that we want to target, but it'd be the sellers. You can't do that in any other business. Think about it, guys. If you were, say, for example, a dry cleaner and you opened up a dry cleaning business or whatever and you wanted to expand your business, how are you going to do it? I mean, you could hypothetically call people up or go door to door and say, do you have any dry cleaning? You know, you got something you clean? You could do that hypothetically, but what most of them do is they're relying on passive means to get their business, to get people to walk in their business. You guys don't have a storefront. Your storefront is the for sale sign that's in the, si in the, in the uh, you know, house you have listed. That's your storefront. Your storefront is when, you know, people call you and they ask for information about your listings or information you have that they, you know, put value on. That's your storefront. But normal businesses, the ones that frankly are suffering the most from COVID, they don't have the ability just to go out there and have that same flexibility that real estate provides. That's the real, honestly, think about this, guys. If you opened up a business, any business nowadays, after you get the rigor more, you know, stores open, you know, you're ready to have opening launch, everything's ready to go. Even if it was an online business, you have to have inventory, right? Unless you're drop shipping, you have to have inventory. Well, if you're going to have inventory and you're going to have a retail store, that means you have to buy the inventory. Um, and it means it's gonna, you're dealing now with complexity of whether, you, whether what you purchase is going to sell, the pricing of it, the discounting of it, the theft of it, all those types of things. In real estate, you can get into business and you can go out there and get your inventory, which normally costs you money for free. That's in the form of seller's listings. And then you basically can put a, a sign in their front yard for free that was, frankly, if you could sell a sign space in your own front yard to a local business, how much do you think that would be worth? A lot. If you could put up a sign in your front yard right now advertising, you know, say that local dry cleaner, what would that guy pay you for that right to basically advertise if that were legal? Thousands of dollars, right? And yet you guys can do that for free. And then to expand your business, you don't have to spend money to expand your business if you're focused on building your business the way we coach you guys to. You can just go out there and pick up the phone and call the people that already have their hands in their air. Unlike, you know, if you're wanting to open a dry cleaner and you have to go door to door asking for dirty clothes. And with, uh, you know, real estate, there's actually actual lists of people that have their hands in their air that say, yes, I want to sell my house now. You guys see all the reasons this is such a beautiful, beautiful business. And yet... 85% of you will fail within 24 months. Can you explain that, Julie? I, I mean, the only way I can explain that is that it, they typically they'll sell a couple houses to their friends and they'll think they've got it going on and eventually after the third deal it dries up and now you're faced with, what do I do? If they make it that long. So I, yes, everything you just said. And it's because people, and I used to think it's, it's a combination of things. Yeah. The people that are in charge of real estate agents don't know what this is reason one don't know what to tell them to do because they never really learned it themselves right so the people that are put in positionships of mentors and office managers and brokers and they actually don't know how to actually go after business themselves and that's the reason that most of them basically have businesses that are you know past client centers of influence yes. and maybe they get referrals from dave ramsey in other words they have not they have not really developed a business that's predictable and duplicatable their business is still it's not proactive it's, it's hoping it's and subject praying. to hopium hopium exactly so they don't know themselves uh how to teach you to go out and get business because they've never learned it themselves and the other aspect of all of it is is that they know statistically that most of you will fail within 24 months um if you make it to i think it's month or year three, your probability of succeeding in long-term real estate goes to the roof. But the first two years is, you know, sketchy. And I think statistically, most people, again, in leadership positions in real estate, know that most agents fail. And so they just don't even want to invest in those agents. I mean, yeah, I think they figure it, you'll come and go, you know, so some they, of it'll work, some of it won't. Right. So they don't know what to say yeah. or how to say it, or maybe they do. They just don't want to invest in the agent. Yes. I think I would agree with that. Yeah. And it's kind of sad too. It makes me sad. Think yeah. about it. Well, it's easy for them to be confused. And I think it's convoluted by all the other crap that's out there in their voicemail, email, text, people calling them, whatever. So how do you choose? And then I think that most people getting into real estate don't have a lot of business maturity. Not everybody. We've had some people come from the corporate world. We've got some pilots. It's you know, pretty rare that but, you have. But that's yeah, the rare. That's, that's the rare, rare word. Most people have no they're, they're, way of telling what's a good decision. They're goofballs like we were. Absolutely. We didn't know what the hell we were doing. No, totally hell no. Into. I mean, when we got in the business when we were early 20s, no one would have hired that. I mean, Julie literally when was a part-time Christmas elf. 
I mean, we talked about that on the podcast yeah. last week. She would work at this year round. She loved it. So she it loved it. Awesome. Yeah. But she'd work at this year round Christmas store and um, a retail yeah, job, you know, a, a retail job. But she loved it. She didn't get anything. She didn't get paid anything. She'd come home every night covered with sparkles, you know, <laughs> which is pretty funny and for a variety of reasons, you know. And sometimes we'd go out for a pizza or whatever. This is in our early 20s. When we could eat pizza without getting fat. And, uh, you know, occasionally people would look at her and Julie thought, well, I just must look pretty because I have sparkles over. And I had to explain to her, Julie, there's it's only not normal in July. There's only one profession where the girls walk around with sparkles when they're not at work. Nice. And it's called stripper. Mm-hmm. <laughs> she hadn't realized yeah. that. <laughs> didn't fly so much in Columbus. No, but yes. didn't fly gloves. No. Yes. What were we just talking about? Well, but, but we, you know, oh. and we had a car cleaning and detailing business together. Yeah. But, but. Well, we went to college, but, you know. We went to college, but as who far cares? as like. English. <laughs> You know, our version of this, and not to make us sound too old, but, you know, I remember within maybe 90 days or so of getting our licenses, our broker handed us this ginormous Remax catalog. Yeah. And he's like, pick some stuff out, guys. You need to get your logo and together. He didn't give us stuff out. Yeah, no, it didn't you know, logo. He said business cards, cards and crap. And, and it's like signs and yeah, crap. And, and I remember sitting there overwhelmed just by that. And these guys have that like 100 times as bad. With all the different ways it's coming at them. Exactly. Well, but that you're you're getting you know, to my point. Yeah. I mean, and that's back when like uh, you, there were really no there were no coaches when we were in real estate. No, there were, we'd go there shadow were, people. Yeah, you go. Well, even then, that was pretty. That rare. was rare. That was yeah. rare. So you just basically were throwing spitballs, mm-hmm. you know, to try to figure out what to do. And so what Julie and I did is our first year in the business, and this, as far as I know, is still a record for the nation. We sold over a hundred houses, but the reason we did it is because we hey guess what that seller is a you know that fizbo right there's got to sign the yard saying he wants to sell his house and then chances are that guy also wants to buy a house so if i go there and you know i help him sell the house chances are he's gonna you know use us to buy the house and, and we would have rock and open houses it, and follow it, up on that exactly we jam the open houses and we yep. just focus on this little area in beachwald yeah and most of the houses we sold and we sold a lot of our own we just worked we did the job we weren't yep. following a road map but we figured it out um, and you know, we is interesting in our career. We didn't stay. That was that was our true north. And then there was a time when Julie and I got persuaded that we should be doing some stupid things like teams and you know passive marketing and whatnot. And we probably stayed that course for maybe a year and a half. Yeah. And and then you and I finally figured out that they were all just basically those were just big elegant lies and and ego plays you know yeah they, they weren't really generating more business they we, just we got of, sucked oh, into that stuff we got sucked into that stuff from going to howard britain stuff yeah and there would be all those vendors there Much and all these we love howard yeah and in yeah. howard would have some big you know marketing guru on stage and talk to you about how you need to spend twenty five thousand dollars on some big elaborate marketing campaign and all that remember the talking house yeah, of course. <laughs> Lots of crazy right. things. And, and then you'd say, well, that must be what I'm supposed to do. Otherwise, Howard wouldn't have yeah. him on stage. Well, God bless Howard, but Howard was getting paid to have that guy on stage. And uh, we did not have the smarts to basically decipher that that was nope. Mickey Mouse. And, you know, and those that's how things are. That same exact pattern of behavior is happening to this day where you guys, people are lending you their, in some cases, unearned credibility about why they should be listened to. And then they're introducing you guys to somebody else that doesn't have your best interest in mind. And it turns out that person has no real estate background, had not been in business for more than two or three years, has no real successes from what they've been doing, but you guys buy it because you don't have the filters to run things through. And your conditioned response is to trust the elders in the pack, right? Which would be your office managers and your whoever else you stumble across. And you just think automatically that those people have your best interests in mind, where realistically, maybe they do, you know, fundamentally, but what they're saying isn't. So they might think that they have your best interest in mind, say that they have your best interest in mind, but for their own deficiencies or, you know, negligence, they don't actually act as if they have your own best interest in mind. And thus you're out of the business in 24 months. That's what happens. And that's the never ending cycle of failure in this industry, just simply because I think it's a people don't want to do what they don't want to do when they don't want to do it. But also, I think it's mm-hmm. the people that should be telling them that other than us, that if you want ever increasing long term levels of success, you have to do what you don't want to do when you don't want to do it at the highest level. I yeah. mean, that is it. I think the people that know that don't live that themselves. So they're not going to say it. Or maybe there's one percent or half a percent out there that know it and then they say it and they tell their agents that this is true. I know some of our own coaches that work in brokerages, this is mm-hmm. how they, mm-hmm. and they'll tell people the truth. But with such a um, uh, huge, the noise out there telling agents these lies about doing things passively, the agents don't, the, the echo chamber is the message of the true message that you and I and a handful of our you know, mm-hmm. devotees are passing along the globe now 
it's gonna it's being drowned out by all the gimmicks and and you guys got ultimately it's, it's because you know you're not being discerning enough about who you're uh, of what paths you're choosing to follow and who you're li- choosing to listen to and that is again i think the reason why you know 85 percent of all realtors fail within 24 months i had the epiphany this past week you know, most of these tech ideas and these gimmicks have come up since 2007, in essence. Mm-hmm. And uh, I had the, I, I'm going to research this, but I think, and I'm pretty sure I'm about about this. I'm pretty sure that the failure rate for real estate has the percent of agents failing has increased, and they're failing out within a shorter period of faster. time. Do you understand? Yeah. Mm-hmm. So they're they're fa- more failing faster, exactly. Yeah. And I'm pretty sure that's true because I fall, I stumbled, I wrote that down. I started doing some homework on it. And I stumbled across um, the oldest statistic I found was from 1995. Mm-hmm. Okay, and that was NAR, NAR statistic, which is probably just tracking our members. Sure. But I bet you what I'm saying is right. I bet you more people are failing faster, and the reason is is because the crap that they're thinking will get them in, and keep them yeah, in business. Yeah, and, isn't and they're working. spending more on more crap because there's more crap. For to sure. Buy. You know, right. as the years go by and as people, you know, I, I've seen some of the referral based companies, which sometimes are, you know, have decent uh, referrals that used to be sign up for free and you just pay a 25% referral fee. Now it's sign up for 2,500 bucks with an ongoing fee and 35%. So, you know, they, they, I think they're spending more faster because A, there's more to choose from and B, because prices are going up on stuff. Well, ultimately it's because agents don't yeah. know how to choose. That's they it. Have no filter. They now have no I will filter. tell you the one thing that that's great in our coaching program is that you know we do that coaching call every day and i pretty much have all of our members trained to ask before they fork over their credit card they'll say right. you know what i got this in or they'll forward something we get this all the time in our email sounds good what do you think about it what's you know is this something worth doing and probably nine times out of ten it's like no don't waste your money you and i'll, do this I'll tell you what I get, when it, julie sends these to me if she can't find the you know the genealogy on this company or the idea yeah um, there's some people I'll ask, but generally speaking, all I've got to do is go to, I think it's called who's it or whatever it is. Mm-hmm. And you can drop in a URL and you can see the date that the uh, URL oh, yeah. was formed That's and funny. you can see who it was formed by. And I'll tell you what I've seen. And this actually was actually sh- Well, it wasn't shocking. It was, Oh, I'll use the first word I was thinking. Disgusting. Yeah. So okay. back in March or April, there was a big surge in um, people trying to sell agents REO lists. Yes, I remember that. And this. agents to get on these exclusive lists. And it was all a bunch of bullshit. Mm-hmm. And I knew it was a bunch of bullshit because we work directly with some, these asset management companies. And I communicate with these guys five times a week. And, and we have people that like Michelle McClintock, who's the number one short sale agent in the country. And she's communicating with all these banks. And so trust me when I tell you guys, in our, all the BPO companies, we have the most and best highly trained canaries and coal mines <laughs> that yes. will early warn us about anything. So this, this email thing was going around. It was coming from two different sources. And it was trying to sell agents into you know, fear of missing out and getting on lists. And it was ma- it, so he, he was sending these lists through one you know, company facade at this email and then a couple days later he was sending another one I'm sure he was sending it to people that didn't buy from the first company and the second was just a fancy sales letter well guess what I went and researched the age of those URLs and I found that the URLs that he was sending from were like months old like six seven months old okay not that's necessarily a bad idea and then I wanted to research to see who owned the URLs and I found one he had under his name and another he had under the corporation and so then I researched the corporation you can just drop all this crap into Google and Google tells you everything and then I found out exactly who it was and it was a guy who back in 90 uh, 2007 2008 Mm -hmm. 2009 was notorious for selling these bullshit lists mm-hmm. and es- essentially scamming agents. We'll sign you up with all the asset managers. You don't have to do anything. Exactly. And then he would disappear. And then yeah. he would the, it would creep back in another six months later. Yeah. And then it, he came and went, came and went, came and went. Hit and, and different company, different everything. Right. You couldn't just you couldn't figure out. You Same know, jib jab, different name. Different, exa- yeah. Exactly. And yeah. he wouldn't use his own name either. I know exactly who you're talking about. Yep. Yes. And so that that started to flare up and, again. And the worst part about that was that agents you know they meant well they thought this was a good idea it's an efficiency play right somebody else signing you up for all of this potential reo work where's the accountability in that how would you ever know if somebody signed you up total complete bs yeah it was total and complete bs yeah but again why were agents liking it because they thought it would save them from having to do work of actually learning how to do it themselves and having to just everything mm-hmm. but in that that particular idea was 
you know, that was obviously, that guy was straight up scamming. But then you have so many other things that are elegant scams where you just don't even know they're scams. Like I was just giving you the example of the predictive mailer thing, an elegant scam, right? Mm -hmm. And here, you know, that, this guy had a big booth, the National Association of Realtors and the whole well, thing. Well, they always say you can always tell uh, what the lie is because there's more detail to it. Yeah, the well, elegant exactly. Scam. Well, yeah. so again, if you're, you're a new in business or if you've never been in business, and you're in, you know, constantly getting beaten over the head with all these competing messages and you have all these people giving their social proof that this particular scammy idea actually isn't a scammy idea. Even, you know, some cases it sounds too good to be true and your intuition tells you not to do it and yet you still do it. Okay. And, and there's billions of dollars that are spent every year from agents and brokerages just chasing all these little gimmicky ideas. And what you guys got to get clear in your head is the ideas were never really designed to do anything other than separate you from the, your money. That's it. That's a, the absolute stone cold truth about 99% of that stuff. Yes, um, and, and, as, and especially the, the worst ones where how would you ever know? You can't check. There's no accountability. Right. You call and they'll say, well, you just haven't waited long enough. When do you want to exactly. resubscribe? Or guys, we, we get solicitations like this from our own company yeah. too. I mean, we, we get people trying to sell us into scammy ideas and it's the same exact learning process, you know, that I've applied to helping you guys that we apply to our own, our coaching and training business. It's, it's just shocking. There's this whole freaking industry out there of guys that basically consider themselves, you know, social media experts, marketing gurus, and all they do is they go from one industry to another to another trying to solve a problem that doesn't really exist, trying to separate small business owners from their money. I mean, that is what's happening right now, and I don't know how we even got yeah, on this. Yeah, you know, I, and I, I think you're right. It's like a different version of the same pitch. I got a weird yep. email pitch uh, yesterday that was just like no ramp up, nothing. It was, uh, do you want a list of all registered nurses in your town? I'm like, well, who's selling me this, and why would I want that list, and what's this got to do with it? I'll tell you what the real problem with lists like that, yeah. if, if the lists were illegally obtained, and yeah. you mail the list, then, then you're, you're in trouble too, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, by association. Right. So there's all kinds of complications yeah. with that. But I mean, people I selling... wish we didn't know all this in a way, you know, because it's like uh, just 101 way to rip one ways that, that people go after agent money. And not just agents, but everybody. Everybody. Right. But we're in that world. So we're more sensitive to it. But I am proud of our coaching clients that, that come back and they say, you know, what is the deal with this? And occasionally they bring one to the call. And it's like, yeah, you know what? There's a lot of value there. And we have lots of examples of that working. And it's something that we coach. And in fact, we have a script for it. That's awesome for them. That's so rare, though. It's rare. There's there's some cases, um, like all the leads would be one. You know, they do a good job, the probate company. Yeah, we have, what's the uh, discount code we have for them if they wanted to look into uh, that? 31996, all the leads. Oh, yeah, yeah. Is it all, was it that? It's just okay. all the leads. So text, the, text all the leads to 31996. Text all the leads no spaces to 31996 there's i agree so, so that's that, that's that's efficient, a company that's proven it works that's a company that provides probate information which that's definitely a great source of business and it's skills based so i'll agree with you on that yeah. one and then there's these companies that basically will help agents get expired information or for sale by in totally information legit. Yep. totally legit i like uh, like ivr companies like 1-800-HOME-HOTLINE.COM mm -hmm. yep. totally legit definitely right you know, the, if you guys want the, to know what your filter should be as to whether or not what you're being sold is uh, hooey, is mm -hmm. just ask yourself if they're feeding into your desire to never do what you don't want to do when you don't want to do it at the highest level. In other words, are they trying to basically feed into your easy button? Um, you know, that isn't with all of us. All of us are looking for short cuts, cuts, but is that the essence of their pitch to you? And if it is, you can pretty much be resting assured that if the answer is they will call you, you will get the leads passively. You won't have to do anything. Low rejection. Establish yourself as the expert. So then pe people reach out to you just because they think you're the all that type of stuff. That's all the easy button crap that you guys need to avoid. And those are the trends that come and go. But if you're in the industry right now and you're following the trends, and you know, I was using the you know predictive mailer thing as an example. If you were just in real estate five years ago and you stumbled across that and you put all your uh, you know, your eggs in that basket and you spent all your money on that and you didn't get any results. Chances are you're no longer in the business and you walked out of the industry with some debt. You guys learning, are you paying attention to what we're saying. So ultimately it's going to be up to you to decide what you want your future in real estate to be. If you even want a future in real estate and anything and everything you want in life and in real estate does come back to always doing what you don't want to do when you don't want to do it at the highest level. Yeah. So, I mean, I can't think of any other better way to end the show. Nope. Yeah, and, and we are sucking at resorting. Yes, we need to. We live we at a resort, at that. and we do spend too much time working. Yeah, but I kind of like the work most of the days. That's, that's good. I like most of the work most Just of the saying, days. Just saying, you know, there's other stuff like. 
right behind us there. Yeah, I know. We're going. <laughs> All right. What do you want to do? You want to go to the beach? Yes, yeah, sounds good to me. Which beach? I don't know. Well, we'll have to drive the cart to stop where it looks the best. You're going to go to Encanto? That sounds great. Are you going to go the to? The Munchkin would love that. What's the other place? What's the? Uh, Barlovento. Uh, Barlovento. It looked pretty rough today, though. Yeah, that's true. High tides here. It's blowing up a bunch of algae. Algae and big bamboo and yeah, trees. I don't, I don't want to go to that restaurant. They're smelling what smells like the yeah, algae rotting. Yeah, you can eat outside and eat and smell rotting seaweed at the same time. It's no, disgusting. that's not going to work. Yeah. Maybe if you grew up here and aren't from Ohio, you wouldn't notice it. You know how like <laughs> people in a L.A. can drive like that and they don't know it's crazy? Mm-hmm. Same thing. Yeah, so I think we're going to the other place Encanto. where it doesn't stink. That sounds good. All right, so you're going to get the you're gonna get the kids suited up? Yep. All right, let's do it. You guys have a fantastic day. We'll talk to you on the show tomorrow. If you need me for anything, uh, text me at 512-758-0206, 512-758-0206. You guys have a fantastic day. We'll talk to you on the show anytime. Remember, the podcast is always there for you to listen to, available a billion different places. It's also available on our main website, timandjulieharris.com.